Now turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. We'd like to thank all that have come along, and I mention again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but uh, the meetings are continuing each night of the week at 7.30. That is Monday night through, no meeting on Saturday evening, and again resuming on Sunday evening at 7.30, which I understand is a change from the normal time of gospel meeting here on Sunday evening at 7.30. Now all are invited to attend and encouraged to come, and if there's an empty seat beside you, you can invite someone to come along to fill it. I made a mistake one time. I said in a gospel meeting, encouraging people to bring people, I said, and bring a friend if you have one. And I didn't really mean to sound it like that, but if you have someone you could bring along, we would be very happy to have them come. So remember those meetings and those who are saved, certainly pray for them, not only during the course of the prayer meeting, but through the course of the day. Now Luke chapter 23. And we'll commence reading at verse... 33, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, that simply is the wrongdoers or the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, and Latin and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing Amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now I am going to refer to other portions of the scriptures, but that is all we'll read for this portion of the meeting. I want to look for the first part of the meaning of the truth of the crowd, the crowd. It seems that Luke's gospel, which is the gospel of the Son of Man and the gospel of man, is taken up with the crowd. It's interesting, it not only brings the truth of, in Luke chapter 13, of the large company that will stand without and begin to knock, and it's the thought of the crowd on their destination when they are cast away and they are told to depart, cursed of God. But also in Luke chapter 18 and Luke chapter 19, you have those two individuals, blind Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus. And they are men, if they are going to receive blessing, there is one thing both of them had to experience, and it was this, they had to get by the crowd. In both cases, there was a crowd that was interfering with their blessing, and they're looking into the provision that God had made for them. But I want to think tonight of the crowd and its denial, because we're going to find as we look at this passage, I haven't read the particular words that are found, and we'll refer to other Gospels, but this occasion is marked by a very distinct denial of the person of Christ. And so I want to think of the crowd and its denial, then I want to look at the truth of the crowd and its doubt. 
we're going to find how that this crowd was marked by one particular word that is a characteristic of the world and the crowded numbers of humanity today. And then I want to look at the truth of the crowd and its dishonor. As I think of the truth of the crowd and its denial, it was quite a day. If you look at the scriptures on the occasion when individuals, when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, it seems it is going to be ultimately the place where the heart of man is revealed in all its alienation and dark intent against God. Where individuals will come together with different ambitions from different religious backgrounds, from different nations with different intents, and they will settle all their differences. And they will join together and they will unite against the Christ of God. And they will, with one consent, begin to cry, away with him, crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. I remember when I was going to university in Dalhousie, that's Dartmouth, or Halifax, Nova Scotia, I didn't finish, I just started. But I uh, went to university for a while anyway. And I remember that when we were there, that we had to take in literature a, a, a book that was a classic at the time. I don't know if it's still used in studies today. It was by a, what they deemed a visionary writer by the name of H.G. Wells. The name of the book was The War of the Worlds. And it was totally fictitious. But the principle that brought forth was very genuine. As a matter of fact, the story was somewhat about an alien presence that threatened the world and how that nations in the world that were much as nations are today, one opposed to another, that those nations forgot all their differences, forgot their boundaries, forgot their cultural differences, and they all united and stood against a common threat. And at the end of it, I remember the theme of that book was this. H.G. Wells said, if this world could find something or somebody it hated more than, it hate, than they hate each other, they would unite against it or against him. It's the same principle that finds a lion and a, and a deer running together in a forest fire. Though they be at different odds and they're animals that normally would be very at variance because of a common threat that will literally run side by side. There was a time when this world united. There was a time when men who had conflicting ambitions, Herod and Pilate, when Jews and Gentiles forgot all the things between them, when the men that were crucified and the men that were doing the crucifixion forgot their animosity, and they came together with one consent. And the language of that company that day was this, away with him, we will not have this man to reign over us. That's the language of this world. That's the language of the crowded numbers of humanity when it comes to Christ. We don't want him. And somebody says, with, a, with a, a veneer of civilization put over us today, I have never stood on a street corner. I have never raised my fist. I have never screamed from the top of my lungs, I don't want Christ. I don't want him. But let me say this. For the longest time, it has been the quiet, unspoken sentiment of your heart that leaves you to this present day without Christ. And what is the difference whether you cry it from the top of your lungs or it issues from the quiet recesses of your heart? It's the same language. It's the voice of the crowd. It's the voice of that large number that say, we don't want him. We don't want Christ. And we're living in a world that apart from those that are brought to an understanding of their need of him, the response of this world, oh, religion, man will take religion up to here. But when it comes to the person of the Lord Jesus, the language of the crowd is, away with him, we don't want him. Not only was that crowd marked by denial, but they were marked by doubt. You know, as you read through this, you can't help but notice on the three occasions from three different areas, 
almost a horizon of humanity that stood there as, as you look across. When it comes to the priests and their following, it says, if thou be the Christ. When it comes to the Roman soldiers that were going to crucify him, they say, if thou be the king of the Jews. When it comes to the man that is on the cross himself being crucified, he says, if thou art the Christ, save thyself and us. You know, when you look at it, really what it came down to, they doubted his person. If thou art the Christ, the anointed of God. They doubted his power. If thou art the king of the Jews, save thyself. They doubted his purpose. If thou art the Christ, save thyself and us. And that is the language of this world. As a matter of fact, if you take that little word if, out of all three of those expressions, you have statements of faith. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the king of the Jews. But one little word, one little word turns it all around and leaves the individual in darkness without salvation. If, if, if we are living in a world that doubts his person, they doubt his power and they doubt his provision. If thou art the Christ. I remember one time visiting in a jail a, a chap that had professed to get saved in meetings that I had in prison. Before God saved me, I was in prison three times and I was really amazed when they let me have a prison ministry. As a matter of fact, the jailers never even used to search me when I went in. I used to go in and they just say, go through. And I'd sit there and sometimes I'd preach through the glass, what they, we call it, the Europe, the little glass windows. Other times in a minimum security, I'd preach right in the room, most of the fellows I knew. One particular fellow, his name is Billy. Actually, one night after we'd finished preaching, the next morning he told us that he had gotten saved. Now, let me say something. Whenever Billy got out of prison, he proved continuously and consistently that he wasn't saved. I know believers can make mistakes. I know that Christians have failures and shortcomings. But when the life of an individual consistently denies the truth of the power of God and an appreciation for the person of Christ and the things of God, you have to take it from the scriptures. The person has nothing. And so Billy came out on different occasions and was put back in prison again and back in prison again. And finally he's going over to do a 14-year bed in the, in the pen or a 14-year stretch in the penitentiary. And he wanted to see me. And I went in and we had to sit through the glass, talk through the glass. It was only a couple of hours before he had to go. And he said, Pete, I don't really know what happened. He said, you know, I had an experience. You know that how after that meeting I was kind of worried, I was upset. But he said, you know, my life never proved it. There was never any power. There was never any appreciation. I was always acting a part. It wasn't real. And it couldn't stand the test of real life. Well, I said, Billy, would you tell me in your own words exactly what happened that you professed to be saved? He said, well, after you men had finished preaching, he said, I went into the closet. Now, I know what he meant by the closet. It wasn't a real closet. It's just a place where they kept the brooms and the books and all the cleaning materials. And he said, I get down on my knees, and I said, oh, God, if I really am as bad as that, and if I'm really on my way to hell, and if Christ really died for me, save me right now. Then he said, I thought to myself, there's a verse about if you cry to God, you're saved, so I'm saved. And he said, I walked out of there. He said, I had a verse. I had an experience. And he said, I had nothing, nothing. He said, I don't know what happened. What happened? I didn't answer right away. You're probably ready for it because you know what I'm preaching this evening. But I couldn't see it. I was too up close to it. So I went home that evening, I said, Billy, I, I will talk to you before you go. I'll try to get in and see you before you go. And I did get in to see him for about 10 minutes before he left for the penitentiary. And I sat there in that room and I just prayed and I, and I asked the Lord I, just to see, let me see what the difficulty was. 
and it became so apparent. Listen to it. If I'm really a sinner, you know what the Word of God says? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no if. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. There's no if. There's an if of doubt in the minds of those in this world, but when it comes to the Word of God, there's no if. And if I'm really on the road to hell, listen to what the Bible says. And whosoever's name is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There's no F. There's the certainty of the word of God. And if Christ really died for me, then save me. And the word of God says, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. There's no F. In that man's experience, there was an if. He doubted the fact he was a sinner. He doubted the fact he was going to a real hell. And he doubted the fact that God gave his son to die for him. That experience was marked by doubt completely. When I went back to see him just for a few moments, you know what he said? That's the truth of it. He said, I guess I have never been convinced Never been convinced. He said, I'm almost persuaded, but never convinced. Listen to the truth here. If thou art the Christ, the chosen of God. That, they doubted his person. If thou art the king of the Jews, they doubted his power. If thou art the Christ, save thyself and us. They doubted his purpose. But listen to the cry of the other man. Oh, I love this cry. God has never left his son without testimony. Never. And in the midst of all the dark bombardment of man and all his doubts and his dishonor, listen to the language of one man on the cross. Listen to the language of faith. Lord, he didn't doubt his person. Remember me, he didn't doubt his purpose. When thou comest into thy kingdom, he didn't doubt his power. That man was totally convinced that this was the Son of God that was able to save. And the Lord Jesus responded and said, Verily, verily, today I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Maybe in this meeting tonight, you're wondering why you're still in your sins. You know why? Because in your mind, there's still an F. If I'm really the sinner the Bible says I am, you are. If I'm really going to hell, or is that just gospel hall teaching? No, that's what the word of God says. There's no if. And if Christ really died for my sins, thank God for the great truth. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and there's no if. Not only were they marked by the truth of denial and dishonor, or denial and doubt, there was dishonor. Whenever I think of those individuals, and I know it's just a metaphor in my thinking, gambling around the foot of the cross, they were literally gambling. I'm not going to preach tonight against the wrongs and the immorality of gambling but can I just take it and apply it like this? There are those that hear the gospel. And they hear the clear preaching of the truth that Christ died on Calvary's cross. That salvation might be the real experience of every individual. That every person can say of a certainty in this meeting and in this world, the Son of God loved me and he gave himself for me. And as the truth of Christ dying for sinners is preached, and as it were, the cross of Christ is set forth in the gospel, individuals oftentimes hearing it think like this. Maybe sometime, I'll get this. Maybe one day I'll have this experience, it will be mine, and I will trust Christ. But not tonight. Not tonight. Hey, hey, not the first week in a gospel series, surely further along in the meeting. Why not tonight? I had a good friend that died. Um, I, I was never a member of, the, of a bike gang, but a good friend of mine was. His name was Freddie Lester. And Freddie was a member of a group that was called the 13th Tribe, which are a bike grand that used to be in Halifax. Now they are a, a branch of the Hells Angels. 
Freddie was one of those kind of people that liked motorcycles. That's really all he got involved with the gang for, is he just liked to go on what they call runs, and he liked to be with other guys that looked after their bikes. He used to bring his bike. I actually went to college with him. He used to bring his bike in his house and strip it down and have it in the apartment and look after it, and he just loved motorcycles. I, I went to high school with him. He was a really nice, pleasant fella and really didn't fit the gang environment. I remember the night Freddie Lester died. I remember the article in the newspaper the next day. Freddie went to a party, and at that party, individuals were involved in things and doing things to prove how masculine or fearless they were. And they had run out of things to do, and one of them came up with the idea of playing a game that is called Russian Roulette. It doesn't always use a snub nose 38, but it, that's what they used a snub nose 38 Smith and Weston five cylinder. And all they did, let me explain it to you, all they did is they take one shell and they put it in the cylinder, and they close it, and they spin it. And there are four empty cylinders, and there's one full cylinder. What is that, an 80% chance you've got of nothing happening? 80% chance. And three men, one after another, put it up to their head and took a turn each and pulled the trigger and heard that click. And then Freddie Lester put the shell in the cylinder and spun it and put the gun to his head. and died three hours later in the Victoria General Hospital in Halifax of a massive brain contusion. I'll never forget the newspaper item the next day about it. You know what it said? He took a chance he never had to take, and it was his last chance. And I have no right in this gospel meeting to tell you that this is your last chance. That something will happen to you before tomorrow. Or for some reason you will never have another opportunity to hear the gospel. I have no right to say that, nor could I scripturally say it. But I could say this. What if it is your last chance? And you're taking a chance tonight when it comes to the truth of a Savior that loved you and gave himself for you. That I'm going to let it go by tonight. I'll trust him some other night. And take a chance you don't have to take. And dishonor the Son of God. God bless his word.